Take five seconds to read the question and then we'll go through the answer. Okay, so we have a 14-year-old male, past medical history of mild intermittent asthma, presents to the emergency department with a productive cough and mild shortness of breath, started before going to school this morning. So it kind of starts to sound like a little bit of an asthma exacerbation. His mother reports that he has been nauseous today, hasn't eaten breakfast. She also states that he has a family history of bad luck with the heart on his father's side. His father is deceased from unknown cause of sudden cardiac death at age 38. Okay, so that's pretty significant. This is kind of, you know, one of those situations where this is very important information. They wouldn't tell you this for no reason because because this is not something you, you know, you normally see. Um, the patient is up to date with vaccinations, vitals are stable, saturated 99%, mild end expiratory wheezing, okay, laboratory workups unrevealing, and the patient's given a single dose of azithromycin and ondansetron. He's monitored in the emergency room, respiratory symptoms improve, and he's prescribed a short-acting beta agonist on discharge. Four hours later, so pretty soon after, the patient returns to the emergency room with his mother for acute worsening, shortness of breath. EKG findings are shown. All right, so what's the cause of this patient's return to the emergency department? So this could potentially be an asthma exacerbation. Um, what's interesting here, if you look at this, so you can see, I wanna say that, again, when you're talking about step one, you don't have to read this EKG, okay, to, to really answer this question. Because if you look at the options, I mean, it kind of gives it away here with the fact that this patient had, you know, quote unquote, bad luck with the heart on his father's side, father's deceased from sudden cardiac death. So right away, you know, you're thinking there's a family history, right, of, of some kind of sudden cardiac death. I'll put SCD here. And, you know, when you're thinking of this, the major syndromes that you want to think about are going to be, for one, it's going to be hokum, okay, because because this can have autosomal dominant inheritance. Um, also, you think about Brugada syndrome, which we already kind of talked about. And you also think about your congenital long QT syndromes, which are going to be the Romano Ward syndrome and the Jarvell Lange Nielsen. You know, based on the question here, I can tell you it's probably not Hogum just by looking at the answers. And not only that, I mean, there's no evidence here to truly suggest that this patient has Hogum. To have Hogum, usually in a board question, they're going to tell you something about, you know, the spe a specific murmur that changes with Valsalva or something like that. There's nothing really here to me that suggests Hogum, and there's nothing in the answer options uh, either that would lead me to that to that answer. So then I'm thinking, okay, well, what about Brugada and congenital long QT syndrome? Well, Brugada, again, I told you classically, you're going to see ST elevations in V1 through V3 in a pseudo right bundle branch block. Now, they only give us lead two here. And not only that, but the other thing that's really important in this question stem is the medications this patient got. The patient got azithromycin and ondansetron. Now, remember, ondansetron is your classic antiemetic. Remember, I said the ABCDEs, right, of the TCA overdose, ABCDE. And F. The E is anti-emetics, which classically is going to be on Dancitron. That's number one to remember. The other thing is azithromycin here. Classically antibiotics, right? Macrolides are the big one. Azithromycin being in macrolide. Okay, so these both can prolong the QT interval, and they're very classically asked about. So if we have a patient that has a history, potentially, of a congenital long QT syndrome, and then you give them medications that prolong their QT interval, that will significantly worsen their situation. And so that's why this patient's coming back with acute worsening of shortness of breath. Potentially, this patient now might be, you know, on their route to developing an arrhythmia, potentially. And if you look at their EKG, there is going to be some QT prolongation, but like I said, I don't want you to necessarily focus on how to read QT prolongation on an EKG. I'd be more so focused on putting the pieces of this board question together. Now, the real question is, right, what they're asking, which one of these options most likely is associated with this patient's return to the emergency department. So remember what long QT is all about. I go back to my non-pacemaker potential, right? I'm With a long QT syndrome, what I'm doing is I'm elongating this portion here. So I'm, I'm making this potassium current kind of slow down, so it's going to be more delayed. And that's going to cause me to lengthen my QT interval. Again, this is going to be due to a decreased outward potassium current in cardiac myocytes. That's causing this, right? Because that outward potassium current is responsible for hyperpolarization. Let's just talk about some of these other options on here. So A, decreased inward calcium current in pacemaker cells. So it's gotta be careful here. This is talking about pacemaker cells. So what does the calcium current do in pacemaker cells? So remember in pacemaker cells, right, I have my funny current, my sodium current, and then I have my depolarization and rapid repolarization. 
and this kind of happens again, something like this. Now this phase right here where I have the depolarization, that's my calcium current. That's the inward calcium current responsible for that phase of the depolarization. This would classically be seen if I had a parasympathetic response. I'd have less calcium inward current that would help slow the heart rate. So that would help instead of it being this rapid, if I slowed the heart rate, I would have kind of a longer depolarization phase. That's what would happen if I decrease the inward calcium current. What's a drug that would do that? A drug that would do that would be something like digoxin. Okay, and we'll talk about this in a future video, but digoxin has parasympathetic effects. It causes increases in contractility by causing increases in intracellular calcium, but it also decreases the permeability of the calcium current in pacemaker cells. So digoxin can increase your parasympathetic response to, and slow the heart rate down, okay? Now, what about decreased inward calcium current in cardiac myocytes? So if I decrease the calcium current coming in, not in the pacemaker cells, but in the cardiac myocytes, how would that be affected? Well, remember, this is where the calcium current is gonna be in cardiac myocytes. This is the inward calcium current, right? It's fighting against that outward potassium current here in this phase. This is actually very classic um, for Brugada syndrome. Brugada syndrome is mostly a sodium channelopathy. You can also have deficits of these L-type calcium channels, but this one's not particularly high yield to remember. The big one for Brugada is this decreased inward sodium current in cardiac myocytes again, and that would cause this phase to be delayed in Brugada syndrome. So it would look something more like this. Now you might be saying, well, can Brugada syndrome cause long QT? I mean, it can, but typically in board questions, this would be more aberrant. They'd usually give you something where they'd show you, you know, ST elevations in V1 through V3 and give you a more kind of specific history. So a question that might come up is, can patients with Brugada have long QT? Can this potentially, you know, this this delay in the sodium current push this whole curve out a little bit. And technically, I mean, this is something that's you know more heavily researched, but in general, I don't want you to necessarily think of Brugada as long QT. You wanna think of congenital long QT syndromes as Romano Ward, Jervell Lange Nielsen syndrome, and Brugada syndrome, think more about your classic findings, your, your V1 through V3 ST elevations. And again, in this question, they're asking about the cause of the patient's return to the emergency department these medications were the new medications that were introduced. And so these medications would probably be the ones prolonging the QT. And these medications, again, when you're prolonging the QT interval, primarily via, especially via these medications, you're talking about a delay in the potassium, rec uh, delayed rectifier current, right? Delay in hyperpolarization. So that's why D is the best answer. And finally, E here, increased outward potassium current in pacemaker cells. So again, that's this phase here in the pacemaker potential. You have this really steep drop in the hyperpolarization, right, from all this potassium leaving the cell. And this is gonna be very classic for what you see with adenosine. So adenosine is going to increase the potassium efflux, and that's gonna actually subsequently inhibit some of this calcium influx you're gonna get here. So it's gonna kind of slow things down. You can kind of think of adenosine as kind of like your reset. Okay, so adenosine is just gonna kind of reset things. And like I said, we'll talk more about this in a, in a future video, but adenosine is really good when it's used for a supraventricular tachycardia, supra being above the ventricle. And like I said, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a future video, but hopefully this kind of clears up. I know this topic can be very confusing and complicated, but I think this is a good jumping off point and then we'll build on this in the antiarrhythmics video.